Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Insilica PLC investor presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen only mode. Questions are encouraged. They can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab that's just situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Please just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company can review all questions submitted today and will publish those responses where it's appropriate to do so on the Investor Meet company platform. Uh, before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll. And if you could give that your kind attention, I'm sure the company would be most grateful. And I would now like to hand you over to the executive management team from Insilica PLC. Uh, Ian, good afternoon, sir. Good, good afternoon. And uh, well, welcome, everyone, to... Uh... In Silica's interim results, that's for the uh, period ending the 30th of November 2023. And, uh, the usual uh, disclaimer, and uh, I just move on to the introductions. I'm uh, Army Lancashire, CEO and co founder. Uh, my background I'm an electronics engineer. I started my career at, uh, at Plessy Radar, uh, working in the defense sector, and uh, I moved into semiconductors in the, uh, the mid 90s, working for Hitachi. Uh, subsequently Nokia. I, I, uh, uh, I founded in Silica in uh, 2001 and in uh, 2016 I, uh, um, I, I met Mark who, uh, who, who joined us to help us with our growth and I'll let Mark introduce himself. Hi, I'm a graduate of Manchester University and a chartered accountant. I was formerly a partner with both Grant Thornton and Ernst & Young but uh, left the profession in 2005. I've been CEO or CFO of a number of engineering businesses since that time, including a spell as a public listed CFO. Okay, just to sort of su su summarize uh, in Silica, as I said, we were established in 2001, initially as a, uh, a consultancy for uh, um, helping companies develop, uh, develop ASICs. So our clients include companies like Nokia, my previous employer, Arm, Dialog Semiconductor, Wolfson, Panasonic, and Sony. So in, in 2016, uh, I, I worked with Mark to uh, change our, my, um, our model to one of a fabulous ASIC company. So, so in this model, the, uh, the design cost, that's the cost of developing the ASICs, so you'll hear it referred to that as the NRE, non-referring engineering costs, are shared with the customer. But uh, unlike consultancy, you get a, a reoccurring long-term revenue stream through selling the chips as they, uh, as they enter into production. So, uh, so today we have three chips in the supply stage. One of these is a, an ASIC for a high-end vehicle uh, that started production in 2022, and the anticipated revenue on that is 40 million over over six years. And, and we also have six chips in the design stage. Um, we, so sorry, seven chips in the design stage, and we're you know they they will start production from sort of 2024. Um, this includes an industrial ASIC. Uh, which uh, um, will launch for production at the end of this year with an anticipated revenue of uh, 30 million over seven years. So, yeah, so yeah, in terms of the business model, it generates um, long-term reoccurring revenue from the development of, of, of selling these chips. Um, Near-term near cash flows, we, we still use uh, co selective consultancy work uh, to, uh, to, to help the near-term near cash flow. So here are the half the highlights from the half year results. Uh, revenues are up 11%, which is broadly in line with what we were anticipating. Operating profit is down compared to last year, but that reflects quite a significant amount of investment that we made um, in, in the year uh, since the, since last year. Um, last year's first half results were the first half post IPO, and since then we've invested heavily in sales and marketing and also uh, research and design. And that's, that's the reason for the fall in the profitability. And it's the same reason gives that the EBITDA is lower. But as you can see, profit after tax is higher, 60% higher. That is a consequence. That also reflects the investment we've made in new business because um, we have to treat the R&D tax credit from HMRC on the tax line. So it becomes below the line. Uh, and that was uh, 2.2 sorry, 1.4 1, 1. for the half year this year. And that is why um, the profit after tax is so much better than the operating profit. That has a consequent impact on EPS, of course. And uh, the cash at the end of November was 2.1 million. Cash uh, last night was just about a million pounds. So current trading, um, as I've just said, revenues are up 11%. Uh, 
and the growth was across all, all, all revenue streams, which I'll go through in, in, a, in a little while. Um, we, during the year, we had two NRE projects that uh, went through the tape out process. That's the process at the end of the design phase before uh, we go into supply. It's important to be aware of these tape outs. We're a relatively small company still, and they're quite big lumps of uh, revenue, and they tend to depress the margin, although as you'll see in a moment, the margin is up. But nonetheless, they do get depressed a little bit by tape out. That's an impact that will not uh, affect us so much as we, as we get larger. Um, but uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, we're getting some history now and we can report on um, annual recurring revenues. And we expect annual recurring revenues for the current financial year to be £12 million. And last year, it was £6 million. Um, during, during, the, during the period, we won a couple of supply contracts. Uh, plus one upgrade of the contract, and they were worth $57 million um, in, in terms of audit uh, or future order work. Um, and it's, I wanted to say, and we need to report, that we're trading in line with market expectations for financial year 24. Um, the outlook is good. Uh, activity is very, very, very good. We're getting a lot of inquiries. Um, revenues are ramping up. Supply revenues are increasing. We expect... Our annual recurring revenues to increase and uh, in commensurate with the economies of scale. Um, committed future annual re re revenue recurring is now valued at 73 million. And importantly, our pipeline, which includes opportunities as well as orders, um, is now $512 million. So, looking at the income statement in a bit more. Uh, detail, as I've just said, the revenues are up 11%. Uh, we'll look at the revenue streams in a second. Gross margins have improved. That's after the impact of, um, of the tape out, which I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, and the impact on pro operating profit compared to last year is, as I said before. Interest is still a burden. Um, we funded the business uh, from 2018 through to IPO with a debt package. Uh, it's an unsecured debt package. Um, it looked quite expensive at the time. It doesn't look quite so expensive today with the increase in interest rates. Um, but that's why we have a relatively high interest charge. The tax credit represents um, the benefit of the R&D tax credit scheme. Uh, and we've, I've talked about EBITDA and PAS already. Split of the revenues. Um, you might expect the chip, chip supply revenues to be higher in 24 than 23. In actual fact, the first half of 23 was still impacted by COVID and we had a number of customers who were ordering ahead of schedule. So that inflated not only our working capital because debtors went up, but also our revenues. Um, that's normalized now and, and the lower number is still recommended growth on what we consider to be the core, core um, co contracts that make up our supply revenues. NRE has, inc has increased, that reflects the increasing amount of uh, work that we're doing for new customers. And when we come on to look at the balance sheet, you'll see that our investment in, in new work is increasing quite, quite nicely. Um, so the total revenue from our fabulous model is, uh, is up over the year, which is what we wanted to see, that's what we focus on. But it's also important to recognize that uh, consultancy revenues have held up very well. We don't actively, go out to develop this, this business strategically. But we, as Ian said in the introduction, we've got some very high quality customers who have used us for many, many years and they keep bringing us up, asking us to do work. And it's useful for us because in working in the, for other people, we learn new IP that we can incorporate into our own IP. So it allows us to develop, it allows our, our staff to have exposure to different methodologies and different ideas. So we think it's worth uh, continuing with consultancy. Um, it also is relatively low. It, uh, it a very, doesn't consume much working capital uh, and uh, cash flow is, is benefited. It also smooths out the business. The supply business, when you're quite small, is quite lumpy and the consultancy revenue smooth it out somewhat. So looking at the balance sheet and you can see on the right hand side at the top what the intangible assets were in May, they were 12.4 million. And they're now 15.2 million. Sorry. And uh, that represents a 50% increase on the investment um, in intangible assets from last year for the six month period. And that reflects the large number of interested parties we've, we've now 
attracting and asking us to do study work or even to start new work on a new chip. Cash is better than this year than last year. Last year's cash was impacted by the increase in working capital, consumption of working capital due to the um, unusual buying patterns of our customers. We squeezed 1.6 million out of out of working capital during the during the period, um, which allowed us to improve our cash position. Um, our debt is reduced. We continue to reduce the debt that we I relate I uh, mentioned earlier uh, by about 600,000 in the in the half, um, and uh, that that will continue. Uh, net debt is net debt has increased mainly because the cash balances this year um, and uh, uh, have, have, ch have changed. So cash flow, you can see the profits of the period of 515. Cash generated from operations, 2.2 million. That reflects the, the squeezing out of working capital of about 1.6 million. Um, the tax accrual for receipts this year, 1.4. This half year is 1.4 million. And so, we we're generating net cash from operations of 3.6 million. And it's important to recognize the importance of uh, R&D tax claim in, in this. Our business model is based upon uh, that process continuing, which it seems to be doing. Um, there's no hint of it not being continued. Although I can tell you that they are very slow in paying the tax credit. We've not yet received the tax credit for, for last year. Um, I think that's, that, that finishes that slide. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Mark. Um, I mean, I'll just touch on some of the sort of key uh, key opportunities we've got going ahead. So, um, particularly design and supply. So, just as a, a reminder, sort of you know, design and supply is where we have the uh, the the NRE, the design cost fund, uh, funded or part funded by the uh, the customer, and then then we get long term revenue from uh, from the sale of the chip. Um, we've secured for, um, a a study phase for a very high volume industrial ASIC. Um, the contract, uh, as I said, is material. Um, it replaces an existing chip with uh, with known volumes. Um, as I said, the, the customers funded us to do the uh, the study phase, I and mean, then Silicon has previous uh, sector experience. So we believe we have a good a good probability, a very high probability of winning uh, winning this uh, material contract. So we've we've also uh, um, entered into a binding letter of intent. Um, you know, subject to the, the contract completion later later this year for a telecommunications infrastructure ASIC. Again, this is a material contract with a lifetime value of uh, 35 million. The RNS for that went out in uh, um, in December at the end of December, probably the worst uh, the worst date ever for being recognised by the market. And the, um, again, the design costs are funded by the customer. So um, both of those very significant uh, strategic design and supply uh, supply projects. Um, so move on to another one, which is supply only. I mean, we talked about design and supply, but uh, when when a customer actually develops a chip, um, they don't always have direct uh, direct foundry access. If they're not used to taping out, um, they would go through what's called the channel partner. And uh, in, you know, in silica is now established as a channel partner. One of the large fabs and a, uh, a large US electronics company. Um, you know, we're very close to being uh, uh, selected for, uh, for, for for that and doing the uh, um, the manufacturing services related to uh, to supplying the uh, the wafers. It's a material volume, albeit uh, uh, lower margins than if you've done the design and put IP in it. Um, but there's some very there's some upsides on on, on this. Um, you know. It will open business to other other work, um, particularly in the United States, and we also expect it to improve our margins on uh, on our design and supply chips because we're we're increasing our wafer purchasing power. Um, you know, it will strengthen our position within the supply chain and within that fab. So, so all in all, you know, very positive, and uh, you know that will drive uh, drive revenues uh, from 25, 20, 26 and beyond. Just some, uh, some business we've got with existing customers. We talked about the automotive chip that went into, uh, um, into production in June 2022, you know, just after we IPO'd. Um, that's for a high-end vehicle with 24 chips per, per vehicle in one particular model. It, um, in, the, in the following uh, May, it, um, we announced that we 
had that chip design into existing models. So that, so that increases the, re the uh, revenue expectations for that chip for uh, 40 million over the, uh, the coming six years. Um, so this does require us to further in invest in the supply chain and actually uh, you know, increase our, uh, particularly our testing capacity to move back to the, uh, um, to have increased capacity in the past in uh, the Far East. So there'll be an investment uh, which is about reducing the, te the, the test time, which is the test cost, and uh, that will improve our competitiveness on, the, on, the, on that particular chip as well. Um, we talked about the, the uh, channel partner status with the, uh, with the foundries. Um, you know, now, now in Silica as a foundry partner, um, this will enable us to execute uh, take out and wafer business with uh, our existing uh, customers where, uh, um, where, where they may be using other, uh, other me methods of accessing, uh, accessing the foundry. So this will, will really help our service customers and, uh, and add a reoccurring revenue element on some of the, uh, of the service ones through, uh, through wafer supply or even, uh, even, even full supply. So Mark talked about uh, design services and the uh, significance of that. I mean, we have a, a, a significant design service project, uh, um, $3.8 million with the European Industrial Semiconductor Company. Um, we're, all, we, we're already working on the, uh, the study phase to define the chip and the, uh, submitted the proposal. And, and this is not only design services, also it encompasses IP licensing within that as well. And moving on to our IP, um, I mean, we have a strong IP portfolio that really addresses our, uh, uh, our focus segment. And that includes cryptography. And I mean, cryptography is one of those, uh, those areas which goes across uh, uh, multiple segments, including automotive, industrial, and communication. They're all things that need uh, cryptography. So we have IP in the cryptography area, radar, particularly focused on automated radar, healthcare, and communication systems. Um, we, we, IP the li uh, we license the IP to semiconductor companies, but we also le leverage the IP um, on our supply ASICs, making us you know, more competitive and actually showing our, uh, uh, you know, that we've got uh, key differentiation uh, by being able to su supply the IP ourselves. Um, so we were, you know, as an example, we recently licensed our post-quantum cryptography IP, which is PQC um, to uh, a world-leading semiconductor company, and this is a pretty uh, key IP. And this this is a new version of uh, cryptography, which is designed to be robust to uh, quantum computers. And uh, um, you know, we expect to see uh, other licenses for that uh, um, for, for that IP in the in the future. I'll hand over to Mark to do the. Uh, Yes, yeah, so in summary then, our investment case is that we think we've delivered good financial and operational growth since the IPO. Um, you know, we could always do better, but I think we've done pretty good. We've beaten the plans that we had at IPO. Um, we've successfully engaged across the automotive uh, sector, the industrial sector, healthcare and satellite communications. Um, the, the, the business model we've got, the, the ASIC supply model is, is a proven model and is now scaling. Uh, and we'll see an increase in recurring revenues over the coming months. Um, and it's underpinned by our own IP and by current project, project revenues that we've secured. The management team is experienced. We've got a lot of people here who have been doing this for a very long time, um, and we're set to accelerate our embedded growth strategy. The further development of our significant pipeline and order book is, is imminent and is now valued at $512 million. So that's the uh, that's our update to you all. I'm very happy to take some questions. Perfect, uh, Mark, Ian. Thank you very much indeed for your presentation this afternoon. If I may just jump uh, back in there before we move to questions, um, ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q and A tab that's situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, but just while the team take a few moments to review those questions that were submitted already, I would like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q and A, can be accessed via your Investor dashboard. Um, Ian, Mark, as you can see there in the Q and A tab, we have received a number of questions uh, from investors during the call um, and thank you to all of those on the call for taking the time to submit their questions but um, Ian Mark if I may just hand back to you just to read out those questions and give your responses where it's appropriate to do so and then I'll pick up from you at the end thank you okay well the first question that's on the list is 
um, as follows. With the market being focused on artificial intelligence, is this an area you will be developing with your chips? I'll take that one. Yeah, I mean, very much so. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, in, Nvidia has been in the uh, in the press. I mean, shares are very uh, very strong there. So Nvidia are really based on you know, cloud uh, cloud based AI. So that's where you know, you, you you have your uh, AI computing power um, in you know, in server rooms. But uh, there's a whole area of AI really called uh, AI at the edge. And uh, what what we're seeing now is really you know, um chips which are at the edge which they, they need a, a combination of mixed signal sensors for sensing the real world but also you know digital ai engines for uh, um, for making uh, artificial intelligence machine learning based decisions so those um those uh, ai chips that are being used at the edge i mean they need you know they need machine learning accelerators um and that I mean, that's a whole area where um, you're using arm for um, Using IP from companies like ARM, you know, incorporating those in the in, in the chips to uh, um, to to allow them to uh, be AI uh, AI ready, and and it's important that they have the uh, um, the computing power at the edge because you know, for applications like automotive industrial, you know, you can't always rely on getting the connectivity to the to, to the uh, uh, to, to the cloud, and they also need to make these decisions in. Uh, in, in real time, so uh, you, you know, a real opportunity for us, um, you know, and one we're, we're well equipped to uh, to play uh, to play in it. The next question is from Marcus A, and the question is: What are the key strategic goals for the next twelve to twenty-four months, and what KPIs should I use to measure progress? I think the answer to that is our, our primary strategic goal is to increase recurring revenues. So look out for contract wins that increase recurring revenues. Um, the reason why that's important is as we improve that, uh, we will generate more cash and we will be able to fund our own development there. So focus on the winning of new supply contracts and on maintenance of the gross margin, which we hope to improve above the 43% we've reported today. The next question is from Harvey R is how much of the $512 million is contracted. Currently, um, about a, just under $100, $100 million is contracted. The second question, the next question is also from Harvey R. How much investments in working capital would you need to deliver this? Well, as I it's, uh, mentioned before, we won't take all that work on. Um, that's the work that has been uh, brought to us that, that we will assess. Um, our, um, our model is based on working on two new contracts a year, um, so we won't overwork those contracts. Um, but we think that we have got sufficient working capital to be generated from our supply revenues to be self-financing um, from the back end of 24, early 2025. Um, but if, if it, it's difficult to be specific about how much working capital because it depends how much of that is NRE, how much is funded by the, cus the customer, and how much of it is supply revenues. Um, it's, it's, it's something that's under constant review. The next question is from Andrew M. With contracts and opportunities across different regions, regions how do you manage regulatory currency and operational risks associated with international expansion? Well, I, I can. I mean, we, we, we've been doing you know, majority exports since uh, you know since we started. So, I mean, we're very used to dealing with uh, you know with currency risks and uh, you know in, international uh, in, international trade. So, you know, I mean, it's not it's nothing used to us. I mean, our, our main currency for most things is uh, is U.S. dollars, as, as, as you see, and we even we even quote our pipeline in uh, in U.S. dollars. We also take a lot of advice from. Uh, professional firms about tax planning and regulatory advice. We've got lawyers in each of the countries that we do business in that can be can, can assist us in supporting that. The next question is from Harvey R. And the question is, can you give us a bit more detail on the quantum of the late cash payments for the tax credit, etc.? So I can. Um, the, the gross 
uh, tax credit from Her Majesty's, His Majesty's Revenue and Customs was 2.1 million, which they have not paid. We have financed part of it, um, but there's a shortfall of about 700,000. Uh, in addition, we've got two customers that have not paid, uh, one as a consequence of the war in, um, in Gaza, where the company is having difficulty getting hold of the dollars to pay us, and the other one is because they're waiting for a, a, a European Union uh, grant. Um, so that's the nature of the difficulties. We, the difficulty with the tax credit was really that um, the government, the Inland Revenue, did not tell us that they thought there was a problem with our claim. They told us three months late. If we'd have known uh, in, a, in, a, in a shorter time frame, we could have dealt with it. In actual fact, there was nothing wrong with our claim, and it was their error in, in assessing our claim that was wrong. And we, we've checked that with our professional advisors, a company called Leighton's, who've been working with us for 15 years. We've never had a claim rejected or questioned before. Um, we've remonstrated quite hard with uh, HMRC and are hopeful of receiving the cash that they owe us in the next two or three weeks. It's, but it's, it's been very annoying. The next question is from Rob B. It says, hi guys, what proportion of your revenue relates to consulting services? Is that likely to be a key component of revenue going forward? Thank you. So we think the revenues for consultancy service this year will be about eight to nine million out of a total of 22.9 million. So it's about 40%. But we, we anticipate that that number will stay, the, the, the revenue line will stay le level for uh, consulting services, eight or nine million, but it will gradually become a smaller and smaller proportion of our total revenue. Um, I hope that answers the question, but I don't mind taking a follow up if you've got one. Uh, the next question is from Harvey R. Has the commercial ramp of Starling been a catalyst for others to invest? Yes, yes. I mean, very, I mean, very much so. I think what uh, what Starling has really proved is the need for a uh, um, a robust um, satellite based you know, broadband connectivity, and, and I mean that's both for government usage, but uh, generally across the board. So. Uh, certainly, the you know the EU are investing in one called uh, Iris Squared, which is a uh, you know th their own constellation. I mean, uh, people are probably all aware the UK government invested in uh, in OneWeb, which is now merged with another company, and and there are other constellations as well. So, um, satellite communications one of the one you know one of our focus area. We've got a lot of core IP there. I mean, we've been backed by the uh, European Space Agency and the uh, UK Space Agency. To de develop some differentiated technology in that area, so 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 you know definitely it's a, a, a you know, people are investing in these new constellations. We're uh, you know we're well placed uh, um, you know as they roll out to uh, to be shipping the, uh, the you know, the chips that they need. Next question is from Steve B. What is the time frame from initial initial phase to real revenue? Real revenues. I presume by real revenues you mean supply revenues. Um, do you want to answer that? Yeah. I mean, the, the, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, so yeah, as I said, I mean, we, we, you know, we've started supply revenue, and they, they you know, they they, uh, they lack the design, design revenue, you know, depending on the project by uh, by by two to five years. So, so we we started this, you know, we we started this um, this business, this sort of supply business. In uh, uh, 2016, we, we had our first contracts 2017, 2018, and they're in. You know, they're reaching supply now, and you know, we see sort of uh, you know, 20, 24, and 25. You know, it's where those seven chips we've got in the in the in the design stage are moving into supply stage. So things will uh, things will really ramp up in those uh, in those years. You'll you'll see from Hallenby's note that uh, 25 revenue. The revenues for 2025 next year are just over 30 million, um, which is a significant increase on this year's 22.9. The next question is from Harvey R. Um, we haven't got a breakdown to hand of the 512 million pound uh, opportunities pipeline, um, but we're happy to provide that at another time. 
So I'm sorry, I can't I can't answer that at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I can just comment. I mean, they're very, uh, you know, in, in terms of SAP, you know, SAP comms, telecoms, and uh, automotive industrial, probably the uh, the, the key areas are fairly e equally split between uh, um, between those three. Slightly lower on the uh, um, on the on the healthcare and uh, the healthcare side. So, but you know, the, the, those uh, um, the three sectors I mentioned, uh, you know, we've got very strong opportunities in those in those areas. Next question is from Steve B. Uh, and the question is, does AI impact on the design timeframe? I mean, not from the point of view of the, uh, um, I mean, of the hardware. I mean, in terms of adding machine learning engines, there's, there's existing IP in there. So you know, um, in terms of people add AI capabilities into chips through um, either a machine learning engine or through actually having a, what they call a GPU. Uh, um, accelerator on the chip, general processing unit accelerator, similar to those that would, uh, you know, you, you, NVIDIA imagination technologies, etc., um, would, would do. So, you know, it, it doesn't take uh, any longer to implement AI functionality into uh, uh, in, into chips. And that second question, um, I, I, we can't answer that question. I'm sorry. Okay, so a further question from Stevie. When do you see the group becoming cash flow positive? Is another fundraising anticipated? Well, you'll have read that we're looking, doing some work in capital financing at the present time. Uh, and um, obviously all options are always on the table. But we see the group becoming cash flow positive around about um, 12 months from now. Um, we've got a big chip going into supply the back end of this year, early next year. Uh, and that will change the cash flow profile quite significantly. Okay, another question from Steve B. What gross margin do you anticipate on supply contracts? It's variable, um, but we're aiming for 45 plus. Um, it tends to be lower to start with and, and we can ramp it up as we go along. The margin you see reported today is a, is a blend of margins from supply uh, consultancy and NRE. You just scroll down the top. Yeah. Uh, the next question is from Tom L. Um, and the question is Does family partners taking you overseas, e.g., the USA, reduce your requirement to hire, hire sales staff in the territory? Yeah. I mean, in the US, we have, uh, we have sales reps there that are very experienced in this area. And uh, you know, we, we, have, we have offices in. Uh, um, in Brazil, and um, we can support that in the UK. So there, there is no plan to put uh, um, direct sales staff, uh, you know, particularly particularly in the US at the moment. Um, we, we believe we can support those uh, opportunities from the time zones we uh, we you know, we already work in, and using our sales reps. This is a question from Bob L. Can you please update us on the investment stroke technology priorities of your target and existing customers? How has the semiconductor prioritization of AI affected customers and competitors, including any impact on pricing pressure? That's a big question, Bob. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, not sure how to answer that one, but, uh, uh, you know, the, I, I said, I, I mean, in terms of chips, chip functionality, I mean, you know, AI is another feature, having AI accelerators. So, you know, um, it, it does it technology node that it goes on. So you, you have to, you know, the, uh, AI is quite memory intensive, it's quite uh, logic intensive. So you end up having to move into uh, newer, newer tone node technologies, things like 16 and seven, uh, and seven nanometers. Um, so that increases the, uh, the, um, the investment a customer has to make in, uh, in, 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 developing, um, in, in developing a chip. It probably hasn't answered all the aspects, but uh, uh, you know, I mean, that, that's the interesting side of, uh, of AI. And you know, we, we have the capabilities to, uh, to design in these advanced uh, technologies, both on the digital side, but also on the, the big signal and the RF, uh, RF side, which is a, a key differentiator for us. Next question is from Gary R. How are you finding recruitment of suitably qualified engineers to support development of your chips? 
I'm getting good engineers. Is you know, it's, it's always been a challenge, but uh, I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're, we've got a very uh, strong graduate program working on where we're looking to bring in, um, you know, uh, fresh talents out of universities, um, and we, you know, we we are based in uh, um, you know, the, the UK. We've got location in Brazil and India. So you know, we, we are um, we are feeding through uh, um, you know, qualified engineers through the, through those locations. So we're, we're, we you know I mean we're fine at the moment, but you know we we, we need to work hard. Our uh, our staff are our our, our our key asset. The next question is from Dan R, and it is regarding the IP licensing component. Do you expect IP licensing? Yet? Sim activities to grow in addition to the fabulous chip design activities. How important is it to the overall growth strategy? I mean, it's not a key part of the uh, the, the growth strategy. I mean, we uh, we have a large portfolio of IP, and some of that IP we make uh, we make available for uh, external um, external licensing. I mean, we, we have other elements which would be harder to support that we don't offer for uh, um, for, for licensing. So you know, if, if I remember from the uh, correct from the Alan Bree note, it was about sort of uh, 200k last year's relatively small amount. But uh, I, I mean, particularly with some of the the uh, unique IP we've got, uh, you know, I, I can I can see that increasing, but it's not a strategic uh, it's not a strategic focus. But uh, but but it's you know, it, it's all it, it's welcome high margin revenue. From Bob L. How do you prioritize your limited engineering resources? Do you regularly turn away consulting projects to ensure enough capacity for fabulous revenues? Has the recruitment environment improved given the distress of a peer? Okay. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mean, generally, the, the, you know, the semiconductors were down last year, I, I think about 10% in their sector, but, you know, we're, which has softened the, uh, the the demand for engineers as a lot of the bigger companies have some uh, some cutbacks. But uh, you know the, 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 the you know the uh, the, the estimate is going to be up uh, up this year, which may uh, um, may may increase the demand for uh, um, for for engineers as it sort of tends to it tends to feed through. Um, so we you know we do look at the consultancy projects very carefully and, and look at ones that are you know either with strategic um, say strategic IP partners where we can learn about their IP and do it all, or in air, you know, in, in, in particular areas where where we believe we can offer some real value and even bring in our IP into the uh, into the consultancy play. But that, I mean, obviously we you know, um, we we do prioritise the fabulous uh, revenue business. We are looking for reoccurring revenue as uh, um, in terms of putting our uh, engineering resources onto projects that we generate. Reoccurring revenue. The next question is from Sats P. What are the biggest risks to your business in the medium term? Well, we do a lot of work with Taiwan. Um, the geopolitical state across the world is a challenge for everybody and is therefore. By definition a challenge to us um, we've already addressed or spoken about the, the need to recruit people um, that, but to be fair the recruitment of good engineers has been a problem for 10 or 15 years that's not that's not a, 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 a that's not a new risk um, I think that, that's probably the yeah yes uh, yeah I mean people, people you know different people have different views on the, the risk that uh, Taiwan uh, that, you know, uh, Taiwan plays in in, in it, um, but uh, you know, in terms of it's about you know the, the probability of that, uh, um, yeah, uh, uh, it, it, it's just about the probability of that. I mean, we, we consider that quite low. Um, but, and and you are talking about the medium term, and in the, if the medium term is three or four years, then there will be alternative uh, uh, foundries outside of uh, Taiwan that we will be able to use. The next question is also from Steve B. And the question is, for new contracts, how many years would you generally estimate it takes to then generate supply revenues? One, two, or three years? 
I, I, yeah, I mean, at best, it's two years. So if, if there's a, you know existing product, very clear design, then uh, or the design and supply, it's two years. If the design's already done and talked about that supply only one, that can be really you know generated within the uh, the next year. We're you know I mean the automotive market is generally slower, and that uh, that can be in excess of uh, sort of three. Uh, Three, three years, but uh, from you know from from a design win being announced to supply you know supply revenue, it, it will be two to three. It will be two to three years. The next question is from Gruff W. When do you expect to receive delayed payments from customers? To be honest with you, in the next two to four weeks, we would expect maybe sooner. Um, you can rest assured we're on it all the time. Uh, the next question is from Steve B. If you only take on two new contracts each year, will this not constrain growth? Um, well, it won't constrain growth. There will be growth. It'll just be measured growth rather than explosive growth. If you take on more uh, contracts than that, you run the risk of not having the engineers to do the work. So you've got to you've got to do it in line with what you you can foresee in terms of your capacity. And how much you can grow your capacity. Um, we took on one and a half con uh, contracts so far this year, um, depending on how you measure it. Um, with a bit of luck, we might do three next year. I think two is our target. It doesn't mean to say we'll only do two. Um, and if we can grow the engineering base, uh, we could probably do more. But you can you can go too fast at these things. This is a question from Tom L. Oh, this is for you. <laughs> what nanometer is your new industrial ASIC that is moving into supply? Yeah, uh, that is 40, 40 nanometers. You know, it's quite a uh, quite a mainstream uh, te technology. The next question is from Bob L. Is growth currently constrained more by sales capacity, engineering capacity, or financing? Um, probably. What we have noticed in the last few months is people are taking longer to place, a, place an investment decision. They're still placing the decision, but it takes rather longer. Um, so if that's what you mean by sales capacity, then that's a fact. And financing is an issue. Uh, we IPO'd in 2022, asking for 10 million pounds worth of equity. We still haven't raised 10 million pounds of equity, despite asking for three on three occasions. So uh, if, a, if a very large chip came along, and last year we did, we did get involved in a bid for a very large chip, which would have been $200 million, um, which we walked away from because we didn't think we had enough working capital and we thought it would be too difficult to raise the working capital. So at some point, financing will have to be an, uh, an issue. Um, uh, but we work on the presumption that if we get a, an attractive enough proposition, then the market would be happy to support us. I don't think so. Uh, that's, I think if you, sorry, the question is from Steve B. Today's announcement says that the current market for ASICs is 1.6 billion, growing to 25 billion. Is there a typo? I, I think below that paragraph, there is a link to where we got the story from. Um, so I think it's, it's referenced there, but I, I'm pretty sure that that's, that's what it says in the, in the link from the independent organization that announced that. Yeah, I, I mean, we would look at the ASIC market as being, you know, roughly five uh, five percent of the, uh, the the total semiconductor market. Which, you know, the semiconductor market is uh, um, six hundred million at the moment, you know, growing to a, a trillion by the end of the the end of the decade. But uh, you know, I, I, I mean, there's a lot of definition about what what people consider an ASIC to actually be. So, uh, you know, so you know, we, we we would look at it at um, as I said, it's five percent of the total semiconductor opportunity. I believe that's the last. I think we've answered all the questions. Mark, Ian, absolutely. And thank you very much indeed for being so generous of your time there and addressing all of those questions that came in from investors. And of course, if there are any further questions that do come through, we'll of course make these available to you immediately after the presentation has ended, uh, just for you to review to then add any additional responses where it's appropriate to do so. And we'll publish all those responses out on the platform. Um, but Mark, perhaps before really just looking to redirect those on the call to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to yourself um, and the company, if I could please just ask you for a few closing comments to wrap up with that would be great 
Yeah, I'd like to say a thank you to all those people, uh, all those institutions, all those retail investors who have supported the company. Uh, we value your support greatly. And we look forward to those of you who are not investors um, deciding to invest in the future. Thank you very much for coming to today's presentation. It's appreciated. Mark, that's great. And thank you once again for updating investors uh, this uh, this afternoon. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected uh, to provide you uh, your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Encilica PLC, we would like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. So good afternoon to you all.